Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Software Eats Traditional Storage. My name is David Davis and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today to talk about this. It's really an exciting topic and we've got a lot to cover. Uh, just a few things before we get started. The first one is you, if you have questions during the event, please use the GoToWebinar control panel there to ask your questions and we'll be answering those questions in a uh, nice Q&A session at the end of the event. So uh, we hope to spend a lot of time answering all of your questions. We also have a $300 Amazon gift card to give away for one lucky attendee today, and we'll be announcing that winner at the end of the event. Also in your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, we have a handout section there where you can download the resources from today's event. We have the slides from today in PDF format, as well as a book that I actually wrote uh, covering hyperconvergence fundamentals. It's a very nice uh, ebook that you can download and uh, check out to learn more about hyperconvergence. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by telling you a little bit about the speakers today. Uh, again, my name is David M. Davis. I'm a partner at Actual Tech Media. Uh, I'm a seven-time VMware V expert and an author of uh, numerous video training courses at Pluralsight.com, mostly around uh, VMware vSphere, uh, vir uh, virtualization, and cloud computing. Uh, I'm a blogger and speaker, and I'm proud to be joined today by Kieran Murthy, who's the Director of Product Management at Maxta. Uh, thanks so much, Maxta, and thanks, Kieran, for joining us today. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. And before we jump into today's topic, I uh, have a couple quick poll questions for the audience just to help us learn a little bit more about you and your needs you know, on this event and on future events. So if you don't mind answering a couple quick questions, uh, tell us what's the size of your company, roughly the number of employees that you have uh, in your company. It's good to know that, to know, you know, do we have small companies on, large companies on, medium size? And then, you know, it's interesting to find out what your needs are in, in relation to um, software-defined storage, hyperconvergence, and, you know, what, what technologies are you considering, you know, now and in the future? So let me go ahead and close those poll results and share those. And as you can see, we've got a good range of companies on, a lot of 1,500-plus uh, employee companies, uh, large companies today, but also some, you know, companies on the small and medium size. And then one more other easy question, and that is how many virtualization hosts do you manage in your data center today? It could be vSphere, it could be another hypervisor, but roughly what's the number of hosts that you have in the data center that are running a hypervisor? All right, 60 or 70% of you out there voted. I appreciate that. Let me go ahead and close the results and share those. And as you can see, again, just like the wide range of companies, we have a wide range of uh, the number of hosts running a virtualization platform in the data center. So that's all the poll questions for now. Um, and let's go ahead and talk about today's topics. So what we'll be covering first is why the traditional storage design is outdated. Uh, in my opinion. What, what is it about it that is, is just not going to work for the future? We'll cover how software-defined uh, storage and the software-defined data center can help to make the life of data center admins uh, easier and, and help to you know, prepare the data center you know, for the future. We'll cover how today's software-defined storage solutions are ready for production, what makes a, a solution ready, and, and why today's solutions have matured um, to the point that they are, or how they've matured to the point that they are ready for production. And then finally, how Max's solutions can help. So briefly, I wanna talk you know, a little bit about uh, an article that came out in uh, 2011. So five years ago, uh, Mark Anderson uh, published a blog post called Why Software is Eating the World. And it you know, kind of, uh, predicted the future uh, from from then and until now, and as we can see, uh, if you look around, you know the the enterprise technology solution, you know marketplace at any conference at any expo, 
um, you see more and more, you know, software solutions. And, and that's because, um, you know, software is getting smarter, hardware is get, getting more commodity based, and it's just getting more and more powerful. So there's so much more, you know, that we can do with it. But he really kind of set the stage and predicted the future, you know, with this article back in 2011. And then I also found it interesting that um, Anderson Horowitz, uh, who's the uh, the uh, venture capitalist firm, uh, the co-founder is Mark Anderson, um, published this you know blog post later in the Wall Street Journal and talked about how his firm had invested you know in Maxta because Maxta is a, a software-defined storage uh, hyperconversion solution and it's just one of the examples of how you know software is eating the world. Um, this is a graph from Wikibon. Uh, thanks to our friends over at Wikibon Research, uh, they published this where they predict you know storage revenue by capacity versus you know latency uh, flash and and hard drive uh, storage solutions uh, from 2012 to 2026 and as you can see their predictions are that really traditional storage you know SAN capacity um, the 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 number of enterprises purchasing that and the dollar amount spent you know over time as you can see is just going to uh, go down and down and down and and new technologies such as you know flash storage and software defined storage solutions are going to increase in revenue over time so um, it's not just um, Anderson Horowitz you know that's predicting this it's you know research firms and and I think everyone out there you know knows it as well um, but why traditional storage is outdated and why companies are moving you know to more software defined solutions you know first off if we step back you know you see the 5 megabyte uh, 2000 pound hard drive there on a small forklift being loaded into a, a pan am plane uh, many years ago um, that was dedicated storage you know from the past uh, but in many data centers, we still have, you know, a SAN array that's at least that big. Obviously, it holds a lot more capacity and it's a lot higher performance. But, you know, we have this big, massive, dedicated box, you know, that, that many companies use just for dedicated, you know, file storage. And it's expensive. We all know it. It's usually the most, you know, single expensive piece of hardware in the entire data center. And you know, companies have to justify, well, we put everything in it. Yeah, that's that's why we have to spend so much. Um, but it doesn't have to be, you know, so expensive, in my opinion. It also doesn't have to be so complex. I mean, a lot of companies have dedicated SAN administration teams. They have dedicated um, storage admins that go and get certifications and go to classes, you know, just to run this single expensive piece of complex hardware. And at many companies, it was only necessary to put in the SAN um, because you know the servers just didn't have the performance or they didn't have the capacity or the feature set that was needed. And so that's why they had to look for this uh, very expensive piece of complex you know, hardware just to store their data. But if, you know, looking back, if the, the servers had have been as fast uh, back then as they are today, and if they you know, had the capacity and the performance then most likely would have, we would have put um, our storage, uh, our data on local storage, uh, assuming we could get the advanced feature set that we needed, you know, high availability, um, you know, high performance IO, you know, things like that, that, that you look for in a SAN. So, you know, traditional storage, uh, it typically has a static feature set. You purchase a SAN, it has a set number of features and that's all it's going to do. Um, in some cases, there are you know, like firmware upgrades or software upgrades that might provide something, you know, additional. Uh, but you're also paying, you know, very usually very high maintenance, you know, to get additional features. Uh, usually, there's also dedicated license keys to get advanced features. So you might have to buy replication uh, and pay for it on each of your, you know, storage arrays. Uh, you're also very locked in to a particular vendor. You know, once you purchase that dedicated SAN. Um, it's it's going to be a long time, maybe five to seven years before you replace it and get a new SAN because it's so expensive, so complex. You have such a, a vendor lock it of such a such a um, investment in it. You're probably not going to move you know off of it, uh, and it's also very difficult and challenging in some cases to move off of. Um, it's also outdated because 
you know, this tremendous complexity, in my opinion, it's, it's unnecessary, you know, fiber channel, iSCSI, you know, LUNs, RAID striping, you know, all these things, in many cases, they just create more problems, you know, in the data center, um, when it comes to troubleshooting, and when it comes to, you know, capacity planning, because you have everything broken up into, you know, different LUNs. And like I mentioned, they, the SAN requires dedicated staff, you know, training and certification. And it's also very expensive to scale. You know, when you need to add new storage uh, to the SAN, you might have to add uh, a whole, you know, disk drawer full of disk. Uh, you have to might have to add many more spindles, and that's because you're using that storage that you have, you know, very inefficiently. It's not just one pool of storage. It's it's carved up, you know, into very specific LUNs for dedicated, you know, applications or groups of virtual machines. Um, and so now let's move on and talk a little bit about the Software Defined Data Center or the SDDC. And many people associate this, you know, perhaps with VMware because VMware has pushed this term, you know, so much. But it doesn't, it's not a VMware only term. You know, the Software Defined Data Center is a, an industry accepted general concept, you know, for running your data center uh, as much as possible, you know, in software. So the software defined, defined data center is, you know, software defined compute, which is your virtualization layer, your hypervisors, such as VMware vSphere. You know, you have software defined storage, which uh, is a, a hyperconvergence solution. It essentially, uh, it doesn't have to be, but software defined storage is essentially running your storage uh, within the compute layer. And, you know, more and more that's being you know, hyperconvergence is the merger of these two into one, you know, software defined compute and software defined storage uh, into a single solution with a single management point. And Kieran will talk more about that. And then the software defined data center is also, you know, software defined networking. So running essentially the three, you know, main pillars in the data center and doing it in software. And then it's managed by an over arching, you know, single point of, you know, management, the, a cloud management tool, along with some automation. So this is kind of where most companies would like to move to, uh, but they also need to be, be aware of that it doesn't have to be, you know, an all, all VMware solution. Um, they can, there's multiple solutions to each of these different, you know, types of software defined offerings. So how can the software defined data center help you? And, you know, simplified management, in the data center, easily scaled, uh, a dynamic feature set, you know, lower cost to scale, uses commodity hardware, and, and vendor flexibility. So by doing things in software, you can dynamically move out, uh, you know, scale out, for example, your storage needs to different types of commodity hardware. So it's a uh, lower cost. You don't have dedicated uh, storage from uh, from a SAN or NAS vendor, uh, you have great flexibility in, you know, these different, you know, silos, which silo you choose. You could use a different hypervisor for the compute layer and, and different uh, uh, vendor for, you know, software-defined networking. But ideally, the management is all brought, you know, together into one place to make uh, management, monitoring, troubleshooting, capacity planning, all those things, you know, so much easier than having different silos, you know, a storage management solution and a, and a virtualization management solution and the network management you know, group and whatever they, t whatever tool they use. So back to this title, uh, the title of our webinar today, you know, why is it the software is eating the world? Well, software is going to be lower cost, you know, by doing things in software, instead of having dedicated hardware to perform a certain task, whether it's you know storing your your data uh, or you know running your network infrastructure, by doing things in software, it, you just you know it's it's a natural that you're going to save hopefully you know some money. Um, it's much more efficient, as we know. We don't have to buy dedicated uh, hardware to do you know certain specific tasks. It's going to be higher performance because today's commodity hardware is is so much faster and higher performance than ever before you're also going to get more advanced features you know and, and an ease of of adding additional functionality i mean if you think of your your iphone or android device you know when they release a new operating system on it you download it you update it you get advanced functionality 
uh, you don't have to go out and, and buy typically a whole new hardware device just to get that. And that's kind of the same concept here with software. When new features are added, uh, that function functionality is just included in, in the latest upgrade. You don't have to buy a dedicated license key just to use it. Software makes the data center more scalable, more efficient, and you know overall so much easier to manage. So how is this possible? I mean, you have faster and faster CPUs and memory advancements. Memory is more and more dense. Um, today's servers you know, can handle the needs of you know, software-defined storage and software-defined networking. Um, they can handle those needs that they couldn't handle in the past. The, the capacity you know, just wasn't there. We also have faster and lower cost flash storage. So um, the, the storage uh, capacities of flash is increasing pretty, pretty rapidly. And as we know with flash, the, the latency is, is very minimal you know, compared to traditional storage. So by having um, all of these components you know, brought together uh, and paired with you know, better and better, faster, uh, more efficient, better designed software uh, that's, that's usually using you know, virtualization, um, we can really do some amazing things today. And I think not every you know, admin out there is aware of, of some of the latest innovations out there. So why is it that software-defined solutions and you know, software-defined storage is ready for the data center, in my opinion? Um, it's because virtualization you know, as most everyone out there knows, has matured. Um, we're running tier one applications uh, on our hypervisors today. We feel comfortable, you know, with our virtualization platforms and really, really we're ready for the next step. I think most companies out there are ready for that next step. They might not have gotten to 100% virtualization, but they're, they're ready to start looking for greater efficiencies, you know, in their virtual infrastructure. They realize that virtualization has, has given them tremendous efficiency already, but I think everyone's starting to realize there's, there's more. There's more that can be done to make the virtual infrastructure um, more efficient. I mean, if you think of the time that it takes to provision a new application in most companies, uh, if you have a dedicated you know, SAN administration team and network administration team, uh, there's still a lot of delay and a lot of if inefficiency because you know the SAN admin has to provision perhaps a, a new uh, a new LUN, do some RAID striping, talk about the capacities and the IOP requirements. Maybe has to order some new disk because he's out out of space in the existing SAN, and you know then the network admin has to provision some VLANs or whatever it might be. There's a lot of in inefficiency still uh, happening, you know, in the IT infrastructure groups. Um, Software-defined storage and software-defined networking are built on top of virtualization. So these solutions are virtualized and they're using our mature, reliable, you know, virtual infrastructure that we've uh, really, really started to trust and, and rely on. Um, Software-defined storage has been proven. You know, there's reference architectures out there for uh, um, software-defined storage solutions, big companies that have done it, um, case studies. Uh, you, you see, you know, massive internet companies that are all using software-defined storage, you know, in some way. So it's not a, it's not a cutting edge, you know, uh, concept anymore. Um, and then, you know, there's this term hyperconvergence, and you know, I think a lot of admins out there are still confused on, you know, exactly where does this fit in with the whole, um, you know, virtualization, software-defined storage. Uh, software-defined data center, you know, picture. How does hyperconvergence, you know, fit into that? Uh, hyperconvergence is really utilizing software-defined storage and distributing that storage across your hosts on top of a hypervisor, typically, and then integrating the management of the virtualization layer and the software-defined storage layer into one uh, point of control. So that's my uh, elevator pitch, you know, definition of, of what hyperconvergence is. Uh, but I'm sure that Kieran will have more, you know, information to share on, on his take on that. Uh, the, biz, the business benefits of hyperconvergence by bringing the compute and the software-defined storage together 
you're streamlining the infrastructure deployment process. So when you go to deploy a new virtual machine, uh, think about if you could just define the IO requirements of that virtual machine and the availability requirements and the caching, perhaps uh, level of that virtual machine um, storage uh, when you're provisioning that VM. And it just happens behind the scenes and it's it's just there. And it's like one giant pool of of storage instead of working with a storage area network and everything that goes along with that. Uh, you get simplified IT operations, so provisioning applications faster, you know, greater efficiency, um, better use of the storage, no more complex storage environment to manage. So you could essentially get rid of the SAN or the NAS and everything that goes along with that, the maintenance contracts, the, the certification, and you could get this granular Lego-like scalability where when you need to add more capacity, instead of you know looking at the SAN and, well, we need to add these drawers and all these disks and, and so forth, um, when you, with hyperconvergence, you just add a new physical server and along with that comes storage as well as compute and you're scaling your storage and your compute together. Um, many hyperconvergence solutions also give you the benefit of scaling those uh, separately. So you might be able to just add storage only to an existing compute node. So you scale by adding more Lego-like blocks and the software, the smart software, this hyperconvergence solution really glues it all together. Uh, more benefits of hyperconvergence, you know, significant performance improvements really over the typical legacy infrastructure. And that's because most hyperconvergence solutions use some type of caching. Uh, they use flash storage, and from that you can get you know tremendous performance improvements uh, compared to what we are traditionally seeing you know in the SAN. You also, I mean, you don't have to purchase a dedicated flash storage array though. You know, with hyperconvergence, you might just have one flash disk in each of your physical hosts and the software-defined storage solution uses that for caching to accelerate all of your applications and all of your virtual machines. You can also use commodity hardware. So use the hardware that you have already, you know, without purchasing new hardware in the data center. And then finally, a simplified administrative paradigm. So uh, a single point of management, control, and monitoring for not only your software-defined compute, but also your software-defined storage. And there's the potential, of course, to redistribute, you know, staffing. If you could really get rid of the SAN or the NAS and you have dedicated admins for that complex infrastructure, um, there, there's always more to do in IT, right? There's always more applications and technology to implement. So perhaps they can become hyperconvergence administrators and, and administer the software-defined storage instead. But the cool thing here is that you know, with hyperconvergence and the software-defined data center paradigm, really, I believe it allows us to elevate all of ourselves to become, you know, kind of the infrastructure admin who can administer all the infrastructure because with uh, these software-defined constructs, the infrastructure becomes less complex to administer. So we can really uh, start to, to become, you know, this infrastructure admin that we'd really like to get to uh, and uh, elevate ourselves, you know, in the organization. The great thing is, you know, when you add more storage in the data center, you don't have to add more administrators and add more, uh, you know, SAN drawers or disk or, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, there are a few considerations for hyperconvergence that you need to be aware of. Uh, take into account the hypervisor, you know, options that you'll have available to you with the hyperconvergence solutions. You also want to maintain your hardware choice. So ideally, you don't want to be locked into one particular uh, model or uh, brand or vendor of hardware, if possible, in a hyperconvergent solution, because then you're kind of back to the SAN you know, paradigm where you're kind of locked into a particular solution. You want to maintain flexibility uh, as much as possible. And you also want to you know, ease your management burden. So you don't want to have you know, one, one management console for the software-defined storage solution and another one for your virtual infrastructure, you want to bring it all together uh, as well as add additional functionality 
So what else can the software defined storage solution do above what the SAN was already doing for us? Uh, what advanced features are now you know, available in this smart you know, software defined uh, solution? And then hopefully you know, achieve some sort of cost savings or you know, reduce costs you know, in the future uh, in the data center by using smart software and commodity based hardware. So if you'd like to read more about this, you can download in the handout section in the GoToWebinar control panel there, uh, the book I wrote on hyperconvergence fundamentals, available in PDF. And so to talk to us about software-defined storage and hyperconvergence, I invited on uh, Kieran from Maxta. And uh, Kieran, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. Well, take it away. Tell us all about how Maxta's uh, solution is unique and how it can help uh, data centers and, and uh, admins out there uh, at all sizes of companies. Sure. Thank you, David. Uh, so we will go through some of the, uh, or reiterate some of the things that David talked about uh, around what is software-defined storage, what is hyperconvergence. There are a lot of buzzwords around in the industry just to level set what they really mean. And then we will go into some specific details about the issues that you may encounter when you are dealing with software-defined storage, how Maxta is addressing all these things. So let me just give a quick uh, overview of what do we mean by software-defined data center. So at the heart of it, it's primarily boils down to things are virtualized and thing, and all the layers of services that are provided within the data center are delivered in software. Essentially, all your main services like compute, your networking, and your storage are delivered in software, and they're necessarily run on standard x86 servers. There is no specialized hardware. There is no specialized uh, ASICs and things like that or FPGAs built into it. Everything is possible through software, and you run your entire data center with software being the core of it. Next slide, David. So now, if that is the case, what does software-defined storage really mean? Uh, as David pointed out, the key aspect of it, at the heart of it, it's software implementation. That's the fundamental portion of it. And around it is we should be leveraging standard commodity, com commodity components. No need for specific uh, hardware architecture. Uh, the second aspect is uh, make it hypervisor agnostic, uh, meaning you are not tied to a particular hypervisor. Uh, today, 90% uh, of the data centers run uh, v uh, VMware vSphere as their primary uh, hypervisor. Down the road, they may want to run a mixed environment. So customers have the flexibility of running VMware vSphere and other hypervisors when required. The third aspect is there is, should not be any loss of enterprise class services from the storage perspective that customers are used to. Uh, simple things like efficient snapshots, efficient clones, replication, data integrity, all the features that customers are used to from a storage perspective should all be available even when they move to a software only implementation. And the last point is scale. Uh, how can I scale my existing environment? Can I scale compute resources only if I require? Can I scale storage resources only if I require? Can I start small? Can I add just uh, storage resources to uh, my existing environment? So all the aspects around make it really simple to, for customers to be able to scale their environment. Uh, next slide, David. So if that is the case, then what is hyperconvergence? Uh, so when we talk about hyperconvergence, as uh, David pointed out, the idea is in addition to just being software implementation, which is a prerequisite, you have to be able to simplify the manageability of it. Uh, provide customers the ability to manage a virtual machine or an application that's running in a virtual machine. Give customers the ability to be able to define policies on these virtual machines or applications so that they get the right level of performance and characteristics that are relevant to the application, uh, not to the point that one size fits all model. Your customer should be able to tweak and tune based on what their application needs are. 
The third aspect is it's software. So the licenses that they buy should be able to transfer across uh, releases and across newer hardware that they buy. Traditionally, customers, when they buy a standard storage platform, they pay for hardware as well as software. When they upgrade, they again pay for software and hardware. The idea of software-defined storage and hyperconvergence in particular is it should be transferable. The licenses, once you buy, and if you, after three years, if you upgrade to a different server or a next-generation server platform, you should be able to leverage your software licenses. You don't have to repurchase them. And the last uh, lines up with uh, software-defined storage, which is the ability to scale. Uh, you would scale your compute resources when required. You would scale your storage resources when required. You don't, there is no one-to-one -one relationship between them. You can scale them independently. And David pointed out another important aspect. You don't need to add resources, or in particular human resources, when you scale your storage. Uh, since it's much more simpler to manage, uh, the same person or people or a group can manage more capacity in their data center. Next slide, David. So now, if, if all these things are true, now let's talk a little bit about the weaknesses in your traditional storage platform and what are the weaknesses in software implementation. So if you look at the traditional hardware-centric storage, if I may say, uh, there are certain benefits to it too. Why would customers or even vendors uh, do that or started off with that model? First and the foremost is they control their entire infrastructure. They control the bill of materials. It gets qualified. They ensure the interoperability between all the different components that are running uh, within, the, within the entire stack, whether it comes to uh, the storage controller, the drives, the firmware on each one of them, firmware on the backplane, uh, everything is controlled, which has the benefits of uh, seamless interoperability, but it comes with certain drawbacks too. Uh, that would lead to vendor lock-in. Uh, again, traditionally we have seen that customers have to pay for software when they do a hardware refresh. Um, it completely eliminates the flexibility. You cannot uh, add the resources from other vendors. So for example, you cannot just uh, increase uh, your disk capacity. You cannot just go buy some additional drives and then add it. You need to worry about is it does it work with the uh, adapter that I have? Does it work with uh, the uh, server vendor that I have? So a lot of these interoperability uh, would uh, would kick in, which undermines the flexibility what customers get. And that leads to an increased cost. Uh, customers have to pay a lot of uh, money upfront and also at the time of refreshing their hardware. Next slide, David. So if that is true, and what we are all saying is 100% true, then are there any issues uh, with software-centric model? Uh, what are the gotchas that I should be uh, aware of? And we all know when we talk about software-centric approach, and we say, hey, you can run on any any server platform, any hypervisor, they come with it, come certain uh, challenges. Uh, as we see, the bill of materials are very loosely controlled. Um, customers can uh, start working with, I'll pick an example, HP servers, and two years down the road, they may want to add a Dell server because it provided some additional capabilities that didn't exist in their previous generation. Um, so there are a lot of things that they can now look at when it comes to software, which makes it very loosely controlled. Uh, there will be interoperability limitations when it comes to that, because we need to uh, look into how do we uh, address the firmware incompatibility issues between the HBAs and the drives? How do we uh, control the uh, firmware issues between the backplane and the HBA driver? How do we make sure the BIOS is uh, at the right version that is required? So there are a lot of interoperability uh, challenges which prompted customers and vendors to move to a hardware-centric approach which has its own drawbacks. And the last one, although not technology-wise, from a business-wise, when it comes to software-centric and when it comes to hyper-convergence, where does the budget lie? Does it, is it the storage? Is it the server? Uh, it's nice to have everything in one, but who controls it? When, when you need additional compute, is it the server budget that lines up with it, or is it the storage? So there are a lot of these 
technical as well as non-technical challenges when it comes to um, software-centric approach. Next slide, please. So how do we address them? Uh, first, uh, the way Maxta is looking at this is with Maxta software and in addition to it, Maxta is developing and developed this interoperability certification software. Uh, this is a piece of software that is installed on all the servers, virtualized servers, where Maxta software would be running. Uh, we would go validate every component. We would go validate the drives, the firmware, the BIOS versions, and make sure that everything matches to what is the latest and the greatest that's supported. So it's not about just building a static hardware compatibility list. This is more of a dynamic approach. What David talked about early on, things are more dynamic in nature. It's not a static implementation. So things, when things change, uh, you go rerun this, it will validate whether it meets the requirements. When you are adding new node to your infrastructure, you can run this piece of software. It will tell you if it's in compliance. How does it relate to your older so servers and storage that's already there, which are part of the cluster. So it gives you a very good view whether it's a go or a no-go. And the second aspect is about partnership. Uh, we have a very strong partnership with Intel and as well as Broadcom. The two key components that is required for your storage to work correctly. Intel from a systems point of view, uh, CPU, memory, system board, and so on. And Broadcom from the controller and as well as uh, the interoperability with the drives uh, from, a, from a drives perspective. So we have built a very strong relationship uh, from both these vendors and both Maxra software and the components are uh, initially tested, validated, then it gets released in the respective uh, organizations to make sure what customers get is a truly interoperable piece of software and hardware that works together. And we'll get into a little more details about it. So for people who are new to Maxta, the next couple of slides, I want to just give a quick view of what, who we are uh, and what our key value and how we differentiate with other hyper-converged uh, vendors. So at a quick uh, overview, uh, Maxta is funded by tier one VCs, uh, Intel, uh, as well as Andreessen Horowitz that Dave, uh, David mentioned before, uh, and also from Tenaya Capital. So the key value that Maxta brings in in the hyperconverged environment is flexibility. Uh, the ability to run on any standard servers, whether it's HP, Dell, Supermicro, Quanta, Lenovo, Cisco, any of the standard x86 servers. Um, not only from a server's point of view, also from a hypervisor point of view. Ability to run on VMware vSphere, ability to run on KVM. Uh, and also the flexibility of scaling up, scaling out, uh, everything to do with uh, being flexible in the environment. Uh, uh, the second one is the ease of use. Make it really simple. Provide them the ability to manage a virtual machine, not LUNs and volumes and file systems and so on. Make it really simple. Uh, provide the scale that what customers are looking for and the Lego-like scale, scalability, which is what you scale what you require and when you require. And being very cost effective in terms of both initial deployment as well as being able to scale. And uh, just a quick view of the uh, accolades that we have got from Gartner and CRN and so on. Uh, Maxta goes to market in two form factors. It's the same piece of software, but it's just two form factors. One is just a software that customers can purchase and the second is what we call a max deploy. Uh, this is more of a custom, uh, I should say, built to order uh, kind of an appliance. Uh, it's not rigid, but it's sort of flexible and it comes in a prepackaged and uh, appliance uh, sort of form factor, wherein customers can say, I want it on Cisco hardware, I want it with X amount of capacity, so much of CPU resources, memory, and this is the cores that I want, a 10 gig, one gig, depending upon what the requirements are, it would be a built to order appliance that what customers would get. And this would be delivered by their partners. Uh, next slide, David. So what's the key uh, differentiating factors when it comes to hyperconvergent software defined storage uh, in the industry? Uh, next slide. First is Maxter's key value is maximizing choice. 
providing, as we talked about, the ability to run on uh, any standard servers, what customers, whether they have in their data center or in future when they are procuring new hardware. This gives them the ability to even negotiate with their server platform vendors. Uh, if they are negotiating between HP and Dell, they get they get this option because now they have the ability to e seamlessly run on these different platforms. Uh, so the other, of, as I said, ability to run on any standard servers. Uh, next is software agility. Provide the ability to be able to run and also even transfer the licenses on uh, onto different servers, whether during initial purchase or at the time of upgrade, now they can just transfer the licenses to a new server platform that they purchase. Uh, most vendors force you to buy uh, your software when you pre-purchase or upgrade your hardware. With MaxTub, you can transfer your licenses. Uh, today you may start off with, as we discussed, an, a Dell server platform and in the due process, it doesn't even have to be a forklift upgrade. You may add one node at a time uh, as part of your refresh cycle and your licenses get transferred over. So it's a brand new sort of implementation model, this hyperconverged space, uh, which uh, from a business point of view is a differentiating factor. And uh, application defined. Uh, as we have seen in a traditional storage model, uh, customers have at least, although it's complicated, they have the ability to uh, tweak certain parameters to suit their applications. Um, for example, they can set certain uh, block sizes on some of the storage arrays to meet what their application needs are. They can set different rate levels, maybe rate 10 for certain applications and rate 50 for certain different applications. But when customers moved to the software-defined or hyper-converged models early on, it was sort of, hey, here is a shared pool of storage. You get well, what is a one common, uh, one-size-fits-all model, which cannot be changed. Um, so it effectively took away the flexibility what customers had. Maxstar's model is more of providing them the same level of flexibility and much more simpler in the sense that you can set these at a virtual machine level. You don't need to worry about different lungs or volumes and so on. You, you, you can very easily think of it to say, look, this is my exchange virtual machine. I mean, or rather I should say, this virtual machine is running exchange and I want or I would like it to be 32K to be my page size for my exchange deployment. You can go set it at 32K. Or if you're running a D SQL database and you want it to be 8K or 64K, you can go set them to, to be that for that particular virtual machine. If it's just standard web services, VDI, you can set it to 4K. So you get the ability to define what you really need. And this expands to be also to setting to your application factor. Maybe you have your database that you want it to be three-way replicated. You want your exchange to be two-way replicated. Maybe your VDI, you don't want it. it should, you could just live with two-way replication. So you have the ability to not only go at a, one of the aspects of paging, but also to the aspects of multiple uh, replication factors that you can set. You can enable, disable compression when required and not required. So there are a lot of these aspects that you can go tweak uh, depending upon your application. Again, all these without losing enterprise class capabilities. Right? So just diving a little more into the architecture of Maxta, uh, as you can see, this is modeled on standard industry standard servers. Each of these boxes, they represent uh, standard x86 servers. Uh, Maxta uh, would install a piece of software on each one of those boxes. And each of these boxes have both a spinning disk as, in, as well as SSDs in each one of those boxes. And the Maxta software along, of course, the hypervisor is also installed on them. Now the Maxta software will integrate all these uh, storage resources together, create a shared pool of storage, and present it to the hypervisor. So what the hypervisor sees is a pool of storage. For example, if let's take a simple one with say 10 terabytes in each server raw capacity and you have three servers. We would aggregate all these uh, capacity together, create a 30 terabyte 
aggregated pool and hypervisor sees a 30 terabyte pool of storage now all these application virtual machines can consume for all interoperable or uh, inter communication between the maxtra nodes uh, it's all over standard ethernet uh, preferably 10 gig but it could be 1 gig depending upon uh, the io requirement and so on so they all talk together create a shared pool of storage that applications now can go access the storage very similar in the concept to the cpu and memory it's like you have a vmware cluster you have uh, let's say dual socket eight cores uh, per server 16 cores three servers 48 cores now you can slice and dice depending upon what your application needs are exactly the same concept from a storage point of view and Maxter uh, doesn't compromise on any of the enterprise class features you get very efficient snapshots very efficient clones capacity optimization very strong data integrity with strong checksums completely integrated into the into the high availability model of VMware vSphere and as David pointed out we leverage uh, SSDs very efficiently for read caching for write caching even for metadata uh, so that we can access read and write metadata onto the SSD any distributed environment is heavy on metadata there would be a lot of metadata operations that we have to manage so it's all on SSDs giving them the performance that is required so we leverage SSDs or flash very efficiently to deliver the performance what customers need and also provide uh, auto dynamic auto tiering the his, the historical approach to tiering is let me go run a piece of software uh, look at the historical data and then move the data depending upon it that's traditional tiering but in the newer model it's very dynamic you read a piece of data uh, if it's in cache wonderful it's re it's delivered to the applications from cache if it's not you go fetch it from uh, your spinning disks or your or your uh, uh, HDDs and now you uh, provide it back to the application and at the same time that piece of data is cached uh, you don't have to go uh, run any historical analysis to find out should it be in a different tier so it's very dynamic and it resides in this tier as long as it's needed and then when the usage goes down it's moved back to a colder tier so it's very dynamic in its approach the ability to do data locality uh, when you have certain VMs uh, read and write data well, Maxta makes sure that your data is very closely uh, located to where your compute resources are so if the VM moves over now uh, eventually the data uh, will also move to where your compute resources are running we all know the best is when the compute and the storage resources are aligned and they are on the same server and they don't have to go across the wire so Maxta delivers that uh, and the last as we talked about aligning with applications giving them the ability to set characteristics and uh, properties based on what the application needs are uh, master currently uh, is, uh, is architected to support VMware and KVM and OpenStack uh, and there are other hypervisors on our roadmap that's being planned to deliver uh, in the upcoming releases uh, today we support uh, VMware vSphere hypervisor uh, and uh, KVM hypervisor and as David pointed out from a manageability point of view it's a single UI providing the ability uh, to manage both compute and storage we are very tightly integrated into uh, VMware vSphere and uh, in the KVM environment uh, especially when customers using OpenStack into the OpenStack environment uh, they get a single pane of glass for manageability uh, next slide so we we talked about uh, interoperability what does this mean we are the uh, certification software which uh, max has developed uh, uh, what does it do what does it mean what does it give uh, the, or what's the benefit to the customer so as i said this is a max developed piece of software um, it runs on any stand any standard servers but in a virtual environment 
uh, and we test the interoperability, meaning we go validate the firmware, we validate the drivers, we validate uh, the BIOS information, the, the firmware of the backplane and so on. Uh, it's not just about validating the configuration, right? It's more, it's something more to it. Uh, we also run stress tests as part of this uh, interoperability certification software. We, we just don't just match these uh, values together. It runs stress tests on on the system, it, it stresses every drive, it stresses the SSDs, uh, making sure that we don't end up with some issues uh, a week after they move into production. It pretty much stresses the entire infrastructure, every components of the infrastructure, and then says, yes, this is good to go. Uh, now, yes, this can be used in production if some things don't work, if something, if there is a mismatch, if we find, if we uh, encounter that there is a mismatch in the firmware versions or so, we tell the customer, look, this has to be upgraded or this has to be fixed before you deploy into production. It provides customers a very, very effective way to say, does my software or does my hardware meet the requirements to run the software-defined or hyper-converged product in production? Uh, it's not just saying, hey, let me go look at this HCL and say, oh yeah, everything is, everything matches as per they have said, it's good. This is more dynamic, it validates on-site. It gives them a very clear view of what to fix and how to fix it. Next slide, David. Uh, the next aspect we talked about, we talked about the master piece of software, what, what it does. We talked about the uh, uh, certification software. The next is about the partnership. Uh, what are we doing uh, together from Intel and Broadcom, uh, of course, Avago, LSI, uh, all them together. Uh, what are we doing? What's the partnership? Um, so as we all know, uh, whether we initially uh, test all these or not, at some point, we may end up with some issues. So the having the relationship and the partnership is trivial and it's a key to success, right? It's actually, in my mind, it's a recipe to be successful. Uh, as we have announced in the past, we work very closely with uh, Intel and Broadcom and so on. Uh, Maxta supported Intel Xeon V3 processors on even the NVMe technology at day zero. This was in 2014 when uh, when the V3 processor uh, was released. We uh, we were uh, uh, we were uh, or we announced it together with uh, Intel uh, at their IDF conference. Similarly, not just from a hardware point of view, um, it's even from a software, from a virtualization software point of view. Uh, we su we supported vSphere 6 at day zero. The relationship uh, and working with all these uh, industry leaders really provides uh, the ability for the end customers to have the newer technology being able to be deployed at day zero. Uh, and Maxta is working with uh, uh, Broadcom to support their next generation HBA uh, that's in the labs today. So gi this gives customers the ability to have a fully integrated, tested piece of software that they're all working together and which is validated by the piece of software and the relationship that we have built together uh, as a team to provide the most efficient uh, support uh, at the end to the end customers. Um, so in summary, uh, what does Master provide to customers? Uh, first and foremost, uh, it provides the choice what customers are looking for in a software-defined model, uh, the ability to run on standard x86 servers, ability to use multiple hypervisors, so on. It gives them the choice. Uh, it gives them the flexibility, uh, the ability to, again, use different servers, transfer software licenses, uh, and also provide the ability to uh, set properties at an application level, uh, maximize choice, maximize flexibility, and at the end, also delivering cost efficiency uh, to end customers. Um, all these with no compromises to uh, the data availability, the data reliability, and also the, also data protection. Um, and the last but not the least is the partnership and the time to market of the next generation uh, technology from both hardware as well as software from the overall ecosystem. So. 
That's what Magstar delivers to end customers. Excellent. With that, I'll hand it over to David. Thanks so, thanks so much, Kieran. Excellent presentation. Um, before we jump into our Q&A and announce our prize winner, uh, just one final question here for the audience. And that is just to find out uh, about your time frame, uh, your interest, your plan for implementing software-defined storage that we talked about here in this webinar today. So uh, I'll leave that up while I randomly select a winner for this uh, Amazon $300 gift card. And that winner is going to be Mike Yoakum. Congratulations, Mike. We'll contact you via email to send out that gift card. Thanks for attending. So let me close those results. And we announced the prize winner. And now it's time for our Q&A session. We have a, just a few minutes left for Q&A. So you know, make sure you post your question out there. And let me bring up some information here for uh, how to find out more about Max's software-defined storage solution. Uh, you can contact them you know, multiple ways there uh, and also send an email to sales at maxta.com or visit their website. So now let's jump into our Q&A session. Uh, uh, Kieran, are you ready for some questions? Sure. All right. Um, so I want to make sure everyone understands because there's a question out here about it. Uh, is Maxta a software only solution? Yes, Maxta is a software only solution. Max Maxta delivers software. Excellent. And so if someone wanted to get started with Maxta or, or test it out, what's the easiest way for them to do it? The, the best way is to just contact uh, my uh, sales at maxta.com. We will pro. The process generally we go through is we uh, provide we once a customer contacts sales at maxta.com, uh, we will provide them the link to download the software. The customers can download the software. We'll give them the trial license. Uh, they can go uh, do a POC in their environment, uh, and uh, based on that, they can uh, go ahead and uh, purchase the product. Or we have actually made it really simple too. Uh, we have hosted different uh, POC setups. We give full access to these uh, servers to end customers to do really a POC. Uh, they can even uh, install ESX if they would like to, uh, or they, they can have Maxta install ESX. They can have the experience of installing Maxta. They can have the experience of running it. We give them full control, make it really simple for them to uh, go do a POC. So there are multiple ways uh, customers can engage with Maxta and also do a proof of concept. Okay, excellent, excellent. And how is Maxta sold? Like per CPU or socket or amount of storage? How is it packaged? Sure. Maxta's licensing model is based on the number of cores and the capacity that's managed by Maxta. Uh, for example, the customer may have uh, 24 one terabyte drives in the system uh, and they may have four systems to start with, that's 96 drives, but they may initially start off with only half of them. And the licensing is based on the amount of license that's under Maxta's control, both from a capacity and from a course point of view. Okay, okay. And let's see, there's a question out here about you know networking requirements. Is, is 10 gig ethernet required between the hosts? Uh, it is not required. Uh, one gig, uh, we have customers who are running both on one gig as well as uh, 10 gig. Uh, some of the uh, branch offices, uh, customers, they all are running on one gig network. Uh, predominantly, we see in the data center, it's been a 10 gig uh, network for uh, all the Maxta internode communication. Uh, we have customers wherein they provide a VLAN. It's a shared 10 gig between uh, a couple of other management and as well as Maxta, but they provide a VLAN for the traffic between the Maxta, uh, for the storage portion of it between the Maxta nodes. Okay, okay, good. And um, another question here just came in. It says, how do you scale beyond the capacity of a single node for the same data set? So to scale, there are multiple ways uh, Maxta allows customers to scale. Um, 
let's just talk about the storage. Uh, from a storage perspective, there are multiple ways. One is uh, obviously just add a new node with additional storage. That's one way. Uh, the second approach is, uh, especially these days, uh, the servers are getting pretty dense. So you, with 24 drives, um, you may initially start off with, as I mentioned, half of it populated. Uh, now you can just add a new drive into, into that system. We automatically pull that in. Uh, the third approach is you could replace a lower capacity drive with a higher capacity drive. Say so you start off with one terabyte drives, um, let's assume that they're all three and a half inch form factor and uh, six months down the road, you can go replace this one terabyte drive with a two terabyte drive. It doubles your capacity. So customers have multiple ways in which they can scale storage. Okay, great, great. Um, one of the questions is about, um, you know, what, what do you say to a storage admin who, uh, you know, in terms of feature set, you know, they're they're used to their traditional SAN. Um, they're weary about, you know, or leery about software-defined storage. Uh, they're concerned about, you know, they have all these features that they're used to using. You know, what does Max's software-defined storage solution offer in, in the way of, you know, features that to to kind of give them, you know, parity to make them feel better? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So. Uh, uh, one of the key aspects that when uh, Maxta started as a company is we wanted to make sure that there is no compromise on some of the key enterprise class features what customers are used to in their traditional storage platform. So if we really look at it from, just to give a few examples from the ground up, one of the key aspects what customers really, when they talk about enterprise class features is uh, data resiliency and data availability. How can How can I be sure that what I write is what, when I read, is what I get back. How do I avoid bit rots? How do I uh, avoid bit flips? How do I uh, make, especially when we are talking standard, industry standard servers, all these things magnifies. But how do I know all these things are taken care of? And the second one is availability. If drive fails, node fails, and so on, how can I make sure that my data is available? So when Maxter designed, or, or when we designed the product from the ground up, we said, Data integrity is absolute, um, uh, the minimum requirement. We have to make it really strong, strong checksums. Actually, we go to the extent of being able to not only, uh, when customers read a block, a uh, lot of times if the data may be good, but the block itself may be wrong. You may read a wrong block, but if you just validate the checksum of the data within the block, it's correct, but you're reading the wrong block. A lot of storage platforms don't even catch it. Maxter catches even that. We not only catch uh, inconsistencies within the block, within the data within a block, but also reading the wrong block itself. Uh, we provide availability when drive fails, when server fails, and even we have rack level availability and data center availability, uh, making sure that data is extremely uh, resilient. The second thing from an enterprise class features would be about short term data protection efficient snapshots, efficient clones. Um, and the third is about capacity optimization. Uh, these days, every customer want to do more with less. Uh, how can I get more capacity uh, and not have to pay for everything, right? So Maxter software incl includes all capacity optimization features, very efficient snapshots and clones, and as we talked about, very strong data resiliency and availability. So there's no compromise in these enterprise class features when customers deploy their Maxa software. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, some great questions. Uh, there's some remaining questions I know we can get back to after the event because we're running out of time and I wanna respect everyone's time and their schedule. I appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, Kieran, any final words to add? Uh, thanks everyone for uh, attending the webinar. Uh, feel free to uh, send a note to sales at maxra.com. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to again send it to sales uh, at maxra.com. We will definitely answer them for you. And uh, for the remaining questions, uh, we will answer them and send it out uh, to the respective people. Excellent. Well, thank you, Kieran, and thank you, Maxra, and thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you.